Russian President Vladimir Putin putting on protective gear, suiting up to visit a patient as Moscow's mayor tells him the coronavirus outbreak in Russia is much worse than figures indicate. Putin previously said the situation was under control, but it may not be, and it is certainly not in much of the world, with cases worldwide topping 400,000. Cases in Italy continue to spike. In Japan, the Olympics now postponed for a year. Cases in South Korea have stabilized despite the fact that they had their first infection on the same day as America. We'll investigate the difference. We're also getting a look at what coronavirus does to the lungs. The grim projections are growing worse. In America's epicenter, New York City's mayor says it's a race against time with cases doubling roughly every three days. But it's not just New York. Cases in Louisiana are starting to spike too. Yet the president says he hopes to loosen the restrictions in this country by Easter. One year University is already telling students to come back to campus, and Congress is moving closer to a $2 trillion relief bill. But with millions of Americans set to potentially lose their jobs and the talk of restarting the economy, the question tonight, life versus livelihood, where is our priority? Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. As much of the world continues to climb that steep curve of new coronavirus infections, we are hearing Mixed messages tonight here in the U.S. In New York, the American epicenter of the crisis, a dire warning today from the governor. But President Trump was out front today talking about restarting the American economy by Easter. At least 23 state governments have now ordered all non-essential businesses closed, and countries around the globe are on lockdown, including India, a nation of 1.3 billion people. The Gateway Monument in Mumbai deserted except for pigeons. Also tonight, new statistics shedding light on just who may be the most vulnerable among us. Our Tom Yamas leads us off. As the coronavirus spreads through the country, President Trump warning the restrictions may infect the economy to a point of no return. The president now saying he wants the U.S. open for business by Easter. That's in 20 days. I will, I will tell you that right now. I would love to have that. It's such an important day for other reasons, but I'll make it an important day for this, too. I would love to have the country opened up and uh, just raring to go by Easter. Later adding he'd I'm like sure to see churches good, full. I would love to aim it right at Easter Sunday so we're open for church service and services generally on Easter Sunday. That would be a beautiful thing. President Trump comparing the more deadly coronavirus to the seasonal flu. We lose thousands. I brought some numbers here. We lose thousands and thousands of people a year to the flu. We don't turn the country off, I mean, every year. The president's own team pressed whether the country should be easing social distancing within weeks, not months. I think the question is really, can we be laser focused rather than generic across the country? In other words, can we use our data in a laser focused, granular way to really look at what's happening on the ground and adjust our public health messages based on what is actually needed by the number of cases? Right now in New York, people are dying from COVID-19. The country's hot zone, the infection rate doubling every three days. One of the forecasters said to me, we were looking at a freight train coming across the country. We're now looking at a bullet train. A frustrated Governor Andrew Cuomo predicting the virus's peak in New York will be faster and higher than expected. 140,000 hospital beds and 30,000 ventilators needed now, calling on the federal government to help get it done. When we went to war, we didn't say, uh, any company out there want to build a battleship? Who wants to build a battleship? Anybody want to do that? That's not how you did it. The president said it's a war. It is a war. FEMA setting up this field hospital in New York. The Javits Center where we are right now is not only going to be a hospital, it's also going to be a distribution center. And here's some of the supplies. You have cots, hospital beds, latex gloves, and the critical piece of equipment, the ventilators. Today I asked the governor about the president's push to reopen the country. To President Trump, what, what would your message be about balancing the economy versus making sure this no longer spreads? We have to be smarter about it. You can't sacrifice human life to get the stock market up. I don't, that is a repugnant concept. There is no dollar figure on human life in this country, and there never should be. In New York and across the country, doctors telling us tonight what it's like. We are soldiers uh, very much in the bunker uh, fighting this invisible uh, virus, and we enter the 
trenches every day when we go into the hospital, whether it's in our emergency rooms, whether it's on our uh, intensive care units. But right now, it feels like I'm fighting a fire with blindfolds on. We're now learning two health care workers from Georgia have died from COVID-19 infections. Gabriel Nahato, a physician's assistant in Atlanta, fears exposing his family to the virus. It's been tough not uh, trying to be as close with my sons because I'm worried about getting them sick. In Oregon, a field hospital going up. In Wisconsin, a rush to donate masks. And the Ford Motor Company now starting to manufacture medical face shields. The virus infecting people from all walks of life. Blood and his oxygen levels were uh, dangerously low, so he's been there for a few days. Senator Amy Klobuchar, who just ran for president, telling us how her husband is now hospitalized and on oxygen. I would rather be there with him right now, and I can't do that. All you can do is call and email and text and try to reach the caretakers who are taking care of him. I've never even met them um, to get updates. And Tom Yamas joins us now. And Tom, it's state governments like New York that are closing down non-essential businesses. Could those restrictions stay in place if the president does push forward and try to restart the economy by Easter? You know, Lindsay, that's a great question because at first the president said he wants to leave it up to the states, a lot of these decisions. And when I spoke with Governor Andrew Cuomo today, he says you have to do this thoughtfully and be compassionate. He says if we think about it, maybe some people could return to work, people who are younger, things like that. But they really have to address the situation and assess day by day, as Dr. Fauci says he recommended even to the president. All right, Tom Yamas for us. Thanks, Tom. And let's turn now to Washington, where all eyes remain on Congress as they race to finalize a $2 trillion economic stimulus package. The Senate and White House are still trying to negotiate a final deal that they hope will save the American economy and workers from the devastating toll of COVID-19. Wall Street showed signs of optimism over the pending stimulus deal. The Dow Jones rising more than 2,100 points today. ABC's Terry Moran is in Washington with the latest. They're still at work on Capitol Hill, still struggling to reach a deal on the massive $2 trillion bill to rescue an economy in freefall. The clock has run out. The buzzer is sounding. Democratic leader Chuck Schumer pushing his troops, too. There are lots of good things here, but we all know that we must do these things. 3.4 million people filed for unemployment last week, according to Morgan Stanley. That's nearly five times more than the highest week ever. This chart tells the story. Just look at that spike. The restaurant industry shut down in so many places is getting clobbered. We heard it in Denver. People in this industry that tend to live paycheck to paycheck, not having like even one is detrimental to your rents, to your car payments, to just everything, honestly. People who get paid by the hour are getting hit hard, too. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, three out of five Americans work for hourly wages. Brian Morin's pizza shop in New Jersey has been in the family for over 25 years. He was forced to take out a $50,000 loan to help his employees get through the crisis. We can't risk laying off our employees and we can't risk them not having a paycheck so they can pay their rents, pay their bills. Amelia Darren owns a small jewelry business in Massachusetts and she says orders that are ready to ship are being canceled and invoices are not being paid. I employ stay-at-home moms, including a military spouse, and to be able to stay in business during this uncertain time is all that we can hope for. Big businesses also crippled. The airlines, cruise lines, hotels. The desperation is felt across the country, but in Washington, still no deal. Lawmakers will work into the night looking to close the gap and get the money flowing. And let's bring in Terry Moran now from Washington. Terry, Democrats have taken heat for blocking the GOP proposal several times, but it does seem like they've been able to gain some concessions here. Explain some of the details of what they've been pushing for and where Republicans say they've overreached a bit. Well, Lindsay, the Democrats who were concerned about a major part of this rescue package, $500 billion, half a trillion dollars for uh, bailing out corporations who have been hard hit. That would be in the control of Treasury Secretary Mnuchin. The Democrats are calling that a slush fund for Wall Street. They wanted some transparency about where all that money would go, and they got it. Apparently, quote, strict oversight, a five-member panel who will watch where that money goes. They also wanted to put limits on how it went. They wanted a lot more money for hospitals. They got that, too. 
On the flip side, Republicans were accusing Democrats of trying to use this massive bill uh, to bring some environmental policies in that aren't relevant to the mo to the moment, like uh, fuel efficiency standards for the airlines. Uh, that apparently is gone, and so the two sides are very close to agree uh, to an agreement. It looks like perhaps as early as tonight. And we've seen President Trump now pushing this idea that American businesses should reopen by Easter. But how does he strike that balance between saving the economy and saving lives? You know, Lindsay, that is the choice, the horrible choice, really, that every major leader faces. On the one hand, trying to save as many human lives as possible in this pandemic. On the other hand, trying to save as much of the economy as possible. It's clear where tre President Trump is. He's leaning hard into saving the economy. He thinks that this pandemic can be managed. He's getting a lot of pushback from public health experts and epidemiologists, but he seems determined uh, to try to save as much of the economy as he can while protecting the most vulnerable. Uh, the United Kingdom under Boris Johnson thought about doing that. They backed away. The Netherlands thought about doing that. They backed away. This virus is extremely contagious, uh, and we can see what's happening with it. We'll see how far President Trump takes this plan to bring the economy back while the pandemic is still emerging around the country. Right. Okay. Thanks. Terry Moran for us in Washington, D.C. Thanks, Terry. Thanks. And joining me now is Republican Senator Bill Cassidy, whose home state of Louisiana is particularly hard hit right now. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. So the state of Louisiana has more than 1,300 cases and at least 48 deaths. Your governor declared a state of emergency today, saying that the state will exceed capacity to deliver health care to COVID-19 patients by April 4th or 5th. So with that expectation, what does your state need to do now and what would you say that you need most? First, the people of Louisiana, like the people across the country, need to socially distance. If somebody who's infected does not go out, that's two to three other people whom they do not infect. Similarly, if they're not infected, they don't get infected should they go out. Secondly, one thing we've been asking HHS to do, which I think they will, is to allow doctors to convert ambulatory surgical centers into places where patients can be sent to. Say you go in for a colonoscopy, you're not doing that, but you can set it up if there's overflow from the ER, they already have oxygen. They know how to monitor. They can other, do all the other things you need. We can use these other facilities to manage the outflow. Uh, there are, I think I've spoken to the governor's office. We've been speaking regularly. They're also planning on setting up hotel rooms for quarantine. We need more testing. But on the other hand, I think there are solutions that are before us. Your state celebrated Mardi Gras just a few weeks ago. Do you believe that all the visitors from around the country to New Orleans was a major factor in this rapid spread that you're seeing there? It's certainly plausible. Uh, everybody comes in, somebody brings it, then everybody goes out. Folks are congregated as parades go by, throw me something, mister, fabulous time. But it is a place where virus can spread. Uh, so yes, that is plausible, but I will go back to how I started. If people socially distance, we can stop that. We can flatten the curve. It's up to us to do our job. Uh, you're a doctor. You've spoken out in favor, as you have tonight, uh, in favor of social distancing and flattening the curve. But today, President Trump said that he'd like the country to be open for business once again by Easter. Do you agree with that time frame? There is a middle way. One thing that I am proposing is that we begin to track immunity. When a child is vaccinated, we know the child is protected against measles. When they go to college, they pull up their, their records and boom, they have them. When someone is exposed, it's thought that they might be immune through this season and through the next season. If we know who is immune, she or he can return to the economy. So the nurse's aide who's immune, it's documented, she can go back to being a nurse's aide in a uh, nursing home and she's not going to infect others nor is she going going to be infected. I think we need to set up the same sort of thing we do for immunizations. Okay, who is immune to COVID-19? And those folks can return uh, to our economy. That begins to slowly lift it off. But how do you know? How will you know definitively who is immune and that let's just say that the, the strain hasn't uh, changed in, in some way that they could get it again? So first, um, uh, if somebody tests and then they clear, they're thought to be immune. Secondly, there are antibody tests, which have to be made better, but antibody tests could reflect whether someone's been exposed in the past, even if at the time you did not swab them to find virus. Yes, there could be strains in the future, but ideally by that time we have a vaccine. If we're talking this season and next season, but we have a vaccine in 12 to 18 months, the vaccine comes in as we rely upon herd immunity and individual immunity to get us to that point. 
Now, your colleague, Representative Liz Cheney, said that there will be no normally functioning economy if hospitals are overwhelmed and doctors and nurses lay dying because we have failed to do what's necessary to stop the virus. Couldn't loosening restrictions too soon risk crippling the health care system? Of course that could, but I thought Fauci made a good point. What you do in a country as big as ours kind of depends upon where you are. Do I think you could drive sheep or cattle across the border of Montana into Idaho? Yeah, you could, probably safely. If you're in New York or New Orleans, do you need to be socially distancing? Absolutely. So we need to do what other countries have done, find out where our hotspots are and restrict travel, socially distance, control that outbreak, but recognize somewhere else in the nation it will be different. Now, the Senate is still negotiating, of course, the details of this massive stimulus bill to rescue the economy, but many Americans are already strapped for cash. So what would you say to a single mother in Baton Rouge right now who's suddenly out of a job and not sure if she can pay rent or make a car payment on April 1st, even if this stimulus bill is passed? First, I will say that we had a bipartisan deal in which 100 senators participated that was ready to be signed on Monday. Pelosi and Schumer blew it up, hoping to use the duress of the American people, of my single mom in Baton Rouge, in order to extract more from the administration. That's what they're trying to do behind closed doors. I'm angry about it. What I would tell her, when it does pass, you're going to get a $1,200 check for you, a $500 check for each of your children to help make ends meet. By the way, we'll also encourage your employer, the small businesswoman who employs you, to retain you as an employee, and whatever she uses to pay your wages will be forgiven from the loan that she gets from SBA. There's other things we're doing, but we're trying to take care of that single mom. Believe me, I care about single moms. All right. Well, thank you very much, Senator Cassidy, for your time. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Well, the economic fallout is only just beginning, so too is the crisis in our health care system and the unique development that the virus is affecting more young people in the U.S. than seen elsewhere in the world. Louisiana, as we just discussed now, the hot spot three weeks after thousands descended on New Orleans for Mardi Gras. Our Kaylee Hartung, who is still recovering from COVID-19, has this report tonight. Tonight, the virus taking its toll. Jeff Gazarian, just 34 years old one of hundreds to die in the U.S. He just had a lot of love and humor and could approach and talk to anybody. Gazarian's loved ones say the cancer survivor was on a ventilator for five days before losing his battle late last week in California. The dire warning now being sounded in Louisiana. Confirmed cases tripling since Friday to roughly 1,400. Don't go out unless you absolutely have to. The virus is here and everyone needs to act as if they have it. Just four weeks ago, the entire city of New Orleans and thousands of tourists celebrating Mardi Gras. At least 270 now hospitalized across the state, many needing critical care. It's like I'm standing at the shore and watching a tsunami coming in, but it's coming in at a very slow pace and, I, and we try to prepare, but I know it's gonna be coming. Tonight, thousands with the virus under quarantine. After reporting from the nursing home in Washington state that was overrun with cases, I began to feel symptoms. My body ached, I had chills and a headache. I took this video in the emergency room. He just came back to tell me I'm going to be tested, but those results were gonna take five to seven days. I think I've got a lot of quarantine time ahead. By the time I received my positive test results, my symptoms had mostly faded. 28-year-old Matt Robertson from Shoreline, Washington, spent two weeks in a hospital, at times unconscious and on a ventilator. He's now rebounding, doing physical therapy to regain his strength. The case could have been more tragic and that there was, you know, that chance that I could have not made it through this. And our thanks to Kaylee. When we come back, Liberty University is opening its doors to students despite the rise in coronavirus cases. We'll speak live with Jerry Falwell Jr. The Olympics now postponed. The worldwide reaction is pouring in. And later in the show, two nations, two very different experiences. South Korea and the United States both had their first COVID-19 infection on the same day. So why are cases in South Korea not spiking like they are here? We'll take an in-depth look, but first, our myth bust of the day. Is it safe to order in? With our own eyes, almost legal pandas escaped back here, a safe haven for the tribal poachers. It's 
melts, it's in the whole thing stinks. Andrea Costa is a hard-charging conservationist with a background in security. His team, consisting of many former FBI and intelligence officers, aims to choke off the chain of criminal activities driving this crisis to the brink. From the outside, it's, it's, you know, it looks like you know, an environmental story, right? When you dive in, you understand the role of transnational crime, the narco-trafficking working with Chinese traffickers, where they form what we call Totoaba cartels because it, they work in the same way, uh, with the incredible power to corrupt all over the places. I got the call to join a group of veterinarians and scientists to help save the vaquita from extinction by bringing it into human care. No other option was working. While Krasta's team works on land on the criminal side, Cynthia Smith leads a team of scientists Welcome back. While many colleges and universities closed for the remainder of the semester because of the coronavirus, Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia is welcoming students back who would like to return to campus while classes are still conducted online. Liberty University President Jerry Falwell Jr. joins us now for more on his school's response to the pandemic. Jerry, thanks so much for being here. Good to be here. Now, this week in a statement, you said that you wanted to, quote, get them back as soon as we can, referring to students who want to come back to live on campus. And you said that that could be anywhere from a few hundred to 5,000 students living in dorms. So why are you ignoring the public health guidelines by welcoming students, faculty, and staff back to campus in the middle of a pandemic? Well, we have about 15,500 resident students, about 100,000 online students around the world, around the country. And we... Uh, had about one to 2,000 come back to live in the dorms, but we converted all of our academics to online delivery. We have uh, experience. We started, we started perfecting that program in 1985, so we're uniquely positioned to serve that co the community in that way that mo where most universities are not. They're sort of stumbling around trying to create some sort of uh, online program from scratch. But we uh, have something called Microsoft Teams, T-E-A-M-S, -T uh, the software. Students can actually be sitting looking at their computer and talk to all the other students in the classroom. Teachers are teaching from home. And uh, the apartment, the uh, dorms, the few that did come back, just a fraction of how many we usually have here. It's more like an apartment complex now with all the restaurants on campus doing takeout only. So we, we emphasize safety first. We are cleaning surfaces every, every hour that are touched off and we are uh, increased police, police uh, protection on campus. We've, we've, we've taken other measures that make it 100% safe for our students, but we have, so, we have about 750 international students who have no alternative. They couldn't go back to their countries. And we have a lot of students who really had no, nowhere else to go but their dorm rooms. And so we didn't want to tell them no and send the problem off on somebody else or push the problem off on somebody else. So we said, yes, you can come back, but here's the rules, social distancing. Every chair has a, every other chair has a sign that says, don't sit next to the person that it might be next to you. Sit, leave a space between. We have every third computer working in the computer labs. The rest don't work, so they can't be close to each other. And so we've taken all the, all the precautionary measures, and we, uh, all the students love it. The, uh, the online program, because of our decades of experience, is, is performing beautifully. And my staff is just to be congratulated they spent at least 3,200 man hours in the last week um, converting over. And we think this is the wave of the future. We think in the fall, if coronavirus is still an issue, a lot of universities are gonna have to follow our lead. Uh, Ivy Leagues have refused, many of them, to, to embrace online. And we, uh, we think that the future is online and we think it's there are going to be pandemics like this in the future let me just interrupt just one second sir i just uh, i'm trying to make a distinction in your messaging here are you saying you are welcome to come back if need be if necessity warrants that or are you saying hey we're back open for business welcome back only about 1,000 to 2,000 of the 15,500 came back and some of those are, are going back home to study online so we don't know where the number will shake out but it was just an accommodation for our students 
And we uh, we really believe. So you're saying if you need to, if you have nowhere else to go, then come back. Is that right? Because I think that's a little bit different from, hey, we're open for business. Welcome back to class. Teachers are here. Business as usual. No, it's not business as usual. We have. Uh, we have teachers working from home, doing the, the lectures from home on this uh, special software, and we have, uh, we have only essential staff on campus that are uh, cleaning staff, food preparers, um, uh, security, and, we, uh, and we're trying to put as many people uh, in the back offices at home to work as well. So it's... Uh, it's, it's a different world, and it's, but these things can happen in the future, and I really right. think that online education is the way to keep education safe when something like this happens. So I'm just trying to understand, because on the website, it says the faculty and staff should report to work as normal, although classes are being conducted mm. online. So one professor wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post yesterday saying that it's time for the Liberty University Board to stop you and shut the campus down before it's too late. What's your response to that? That professor had no facts. She had no idea all the changes we had made. And she wrote that piece before we released the new policies and all the new procedures. And so I'm sure she's a little embarrassed now, but we, we, uh, we are letting all the faculty are teaching online from their homes. It's their choice. If they say they feel like they're at risk, they don't have to come into the office and counsel with students. And so we're taking their word for it. And so it was just an erroneous uh, editorial. But we, uh, we're operating like every other college in the state of Virginia, abiding by all the governor's orders to the letter of the law. And every college in Virginia has some students on campus, international students and others, who had no choice. We're not doing anything different than any of those colleges. And we uh, are, like I said, we're like an apartment complex and an online university. The university is not the apartment complex anymore. It's, it's separate. And so just, it's, we're uh, just running out of time, so I hate to interrupt you. I'm sorry, but just want to get last question into you. Last week on Todd Starnes' radio show, you said that the media is fanning up the coronavirus to destroy the American economy and hurt President Trump. Do you still feel that the virus is hurting the economy more than it is people? You know, I think it's a very serious situation, and I think we all have to take, I think the president's doing a wonderful job of managing it like a CEO, like you would expect a CEO to do. And I think it's something we all have to take seriously, but it's not being hyped like the swine flu, H1N1 was when President Obama was president and many more died. It's, uh, it's some interesting parallels there, but that's what I was referring to. Okay, Jerry Falwell Jr., thank you so much for your time and coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you. And now let's bring in Dr. Nermeen Boutros. Doctor, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So first I want to ask you, what are you seeing in your ER, and are there enough beds and respirators for uh, the current patients that you have who you suspect have COVID-19? So actually in the ER is really a hectic right now because we keep getting more patients and more patients and the volume is uh, really increasing uh, and now. So yeah, we are running uh, tight in terms of uh, ventilators, uh, isolation rooms, uh, beds for the patients. We are doing our best trying to accommodate um, change the structures of the teams, creating new teams, creating a new uh, COVID ICU unit, um, creating a new uh, floor for isolation, but we're still very tight and we need more uh, supplies. Yeah. If you could just wave a magic wand, what would you say that your hospital still needs to fully serve your patients? And does your staff have the critical protective gear that you need and are you bracing for shortages? So I understand that it's a national shortage in, in terms of uh, PPE, uh, but I cannot emphasize enough on how important uh, this uh, uh, PPE to doctors and nurses and also healthcare workers, because uh, every healthcare member not right now is very precious and um, irreplaceable. We need all uh, the doctors right now. We cannot afford that any of the doctors fall sick um, or anything. So. Um, uh, the hospital management here um, trying uh, their best to uh, provide us with the supplies, but we still need more because it's a continuous consumption of these PPEs, so we need continuous supply. 
It, some hospitals are urging patients to put off surgeries, in some cases really serious surgeries during this uh, coronavirus crisis. Is that your advice as well? And if so, does that apply to every surgery? Could Americans start getting sicker if we delay other health care needs? Uh, we understand, but uh, and at this point, we have to uh, be flexible if uh, there is an elective surgery or elective procedures that can be postponed for a few weeks. We have to do this. Uh, I know it's, uh, it might like delay um, patient care on the other uh, side, but we have to do this. Right now, we have to deal with the acuity of the COVID crisis. So, uh, it's, it's, it's not a choice. We have to delay any elective procedure and we have to be um, very flexible in this uh, critical situation. And we've also heard of those who need certain medications like hydrocloxy, uh, chloroquine, which helps treat lupus, not being able to find it. Many people are saying who really have it, who need it. How concerning is that? Uh, I'm concerned that uh, uh, People may try to like uh, prescribe it uh, uh, for not ne not the right patient, not necessarily, uh, because uh, it's recommended for those acute uh, acutely ill patients or uh, those are with severe lung injuries and uh, in certain situation. It's not for everyone. It's not for protection. And uh, if we're running short of this medication, we are preventing other patients, uh, like lupus patient or some other rheumatology patient. Uh, from having uh, this drug. And um, I think we have to be wise in the way we are using this drug and treating patients. Uh, President Trump today said that he hopes to get the economy running again by Easter, which presumably means less social distancing. So does that worry you? And what would that mean for healthcare workers on the front lines? I cannot comment on uh, um, the political decision. Uh, as physicians, we will continue uh, doing our job, taking care of the patient, um, doing everything possible to take care of our patients and make them getting better. And I will leave the political decision for the politicians. All right, doctor, thank you so much for your time and for talking with us. Stay safe and thank you for the work thank that you, you. do. We, we greatly appreciate it. And we still have a lot to report out here today. The growing desperation, the Americans stuck abroad, struggling to return home. We'll speak with a few of them. And our tweet of the day from Missy Elliott. In times like these, the news... The 2020 Summer Olympics, now the latest major sports cancellation caused by the global COVID-19 pandemic. So let's take a look by the numbers. The summer of 2021, that's when the 2020 Summer Olympics will now be held in Tokyo after Japanese officials and the International Olympic Committee announced today the games would be postponed. Some 11,000 athletes from more than 200 countries were expected to compete in the summer games, but the global pandemic halted training and would likely make travel in the coming months virtually impossible. And after two nations, Canada and Australia announced that they would not send their athletes to Tokyo if the games went on, followed by the U.S. swimming and track and field teams can't calling for postponement. The writing on was on the wall for a delay. The Olympics have not been postponed in recent years, but they were last canceled in 1944 as well as 1940 due to World War II, with the 1940 games originally scheduled for Tokyo as well. Japan has reportedly spent more than $12 billion to organize this year's Olympics, meaning postponing it will likely be a costly move, but hopefully the games will indeed go on next summer 
without a hitch. And we still have a lot more to get into tonight. 743 people today in Italy dead. But could their curve possibly be flattening? We certainly hope so. And our closer look, how did South Korea manage the coronavirus emergency so much better than we are? But first, here are some of the trending headlines on abcnews.com. What's the most innovative daily? Capitol Hill inching closer to scoring a touchdown on a $2 trillion stimulus package for COVID-19 relief. Last night, I thought we were on the five-yard line. Right now, we're on the two. If we act today, what Americans will remember and what history will record is that the Senate did the right thing. Democrats still pushing for greater accountability on corporate bailout money and additional protections for families, health care workers, and hospitals. The optimism resonating on Wall Street. Stock surging on hopes of an economic relief plan. More than 2,000 points up, its biggest point gain ever. President Trump now pushing to get Americans back to work by Easter, even though the World Health Organization says America could become the new epicenter for the COVID-19 pandemic due to the rapid acceleration here. Our country is not supposed to be, you know, it's not, it's not built to shut down. More than 20 states instituting orders to close non-essential businesses in Houston, Miami, New Jersey, long lines of people waiting to be tested. Please only seek a test if you have symptoms. New York continues to be America's epicenter. The governor also pleading with government officials to release 20,000 ventilators currently in a national stockpile. FEMA says we're sending 400 ventilators when I need 30,000. You pick the 26,000 people who are going to die because you only sent 400 ventilators. The International Olympic Committee has postponed this summer's Tokyo Games for a year at least. The IOC is acting on the recommendation of Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Terrence McNally, one of America's great playwrights, has died of complications from coronavirus. McNally was a lung cancer survivor who lived with chronic inflammatory lung disease. He was 81 years old. Stranded, scrambling, and scared. That is the case for thousands of Americans who are currently stuck abroad and trying to make it back into the United States. An estimated 9,000 Americans have been repatriated from 28 countries, according to the latest numbers from the State Department. But thousands more remain stranded. We caught up with a few of those people anxiously awaiting help. 
my mom and I are travel buddies and every year we make sure to do an international trip together. This year we planned on going to Antarctica. So we went through Argentina down to the end of the world, Ushuaia, made it safely to Antarctica. I am currently in El Progreso Yoro, Honduras. I came a little over a week ago uh, to visit my grandparents and my family here. The captain comes over the speaker multiple times a day. Each time he does that, our stomachs drop, of course, and he lets us know what's going on as far as the Coral Princess is concerned. We found out that our flights had been canceled and we were brought to our hotel where we are now um, quarantined to our room. I landed here on a Saturday. The next day on a Sunday at 9 p.m., the government announced that they were closing borders at midnight that same day, giving Americans only a three hour uh, window to leave and by then all airlines were canceling their flights and there were no air, uh, flights coming out. It's now cost us $5,000 in airfare that we haven't taken. We currently have flights going out on the 26th but we'd had that same flight going out on the 22nd that was canceled. The embassy is trying its best but as of now uh, charter flights are um, helping Americans leave the country to go back home. I'm getting nervous because I am diabetic and so is my husband and I want to be sure that we have enough pills until we get off the ship. We're really working hard to keep ourselves positive in this time. Help me, Donald, yeah. Get, get back, back to, to the, the USA, USA, please. Got to appreciate their positivity during these tough times and the ripple effects that so many of us are experiencing. And now overseas, where the global epicenter of this virus may be shifting in Spain, more than 500 dead in just one day and a horrifying discovery in a Spanish nursing home. Meanwhile, some welcome news from Italy. That country's infection rate appears to be slowing down. And today, perhaps the most startling lockdown yet, India ordered all 1.3 billion of its people to stay at home for three weeks. Our James Longman has the latest from around the globe. Death is everywhere in Spain. This ice rink in Madrid transformed into a morgue, officials taking every possible precaution. Still, more than 500 died in a day. The country now seeing a faster infection rate than Italy. These images posted on social media show a hospital overwhelmed. An alarm tonight that the bodies of the elderly are lying abandoned at nursing homes across the country. The Spanish armed forces finding seniors in extreme and unsanitary conditions, corpses still in their beds in at least four locations. This woman desperate for news of her 97-year-old mother. We live in anguish, she says, with no information whatsoever. It's an unrelenting spread. Over 400,000 people now confirmed infected worldwide, up 100,000 since just Saturday. Some 85% of new infections from Europe and the United States. The horrifying toll continues in Italy. 743 more deaths in the last 24 hours. Although there is cautious hope, the infection rate there is slowly reducing. Other countries mirroring their national lockdown to stem the tide. Tonight, India attempting the largest ever. It's 1.3 billion people ordered to stay home for 21 days. Japan bowing to the inevitable. The Olympics is now postponed, possibly until next year. China, meanwhile, has tonight ended its two-month lockdown of Hubei province, where coronavirus first emerged. Its epicenter, Wuhan, will reopen April 8th. Optimistic that its nightmare is ending, whilst the rest of the world prepares for the worst. And we're here now with James Longman. So, James, tell us more about the restrictions that seem to be working in other countries and the new lockdown in India. Yeah, India is a really remarkable story. We're talking about 1.3 billion people, something like a fifth of the world's population, and they have just instituted a 21-day national lockdown. It really is uh, unprecedented. Now, they only have had recorded about 10 deaths and something in the region of about 500 cases, but they really want to get ahead of this thing. It remains to be seen 
if they're going to be able to actually kind of enforce it, because we've seen a one-day lockdown. They, they carried that out in Delhi and Mumbai, two of the biggest cities, and no one really paid much attention to it. But Nahendra Modi, the Prime Minister, is really, really keen to make sure that people do adhere to this. He's saying we've got 21 days to make sure we don't go back 21 years, which I thought was quite a powerful thing to say. Other countries as well are stepping up. The French are now a week into their national lockdown. But we're hearing now that the French scientific advisers are telling the government that they think six weeks, uh, they think a national lockdown should actually take place for six weeks. So if you compare that to what Donald Trump has been saying about being ready and open for business by Easter, the contrast is quite extraordinary. Here in the UK, I think it's fair to say there was a bit of a lukewarm reaction to begin with by the government to this virus, but certainly now things are really stepping up. Uh, the government is talking about a volunteer army of 250,000 people uh, to, to kind of volunteer to take medicine and food to the elderly, to their homes. They're trying to get people out of retirement. They're appealing to newly uh, graduated students in order to help with uh, with anything really to try to get keep this country moving throughout its lockdown. So a lot of countries doing what they can to avoid the scenes we're seeing in Italy and now in Spain particularly play out. Right in Italy and Spain especially um, precarious in both of those countries. In Italy though where the news has been so grim finally some positive signs. Yeah, I mean, look, this is, uh, I mean, look, there is a lot of, there's a lot of guesswork about just exactly uh, what the numbers mean in Italy, and the government are certainly saying it's too soon to, to say uh, for sure. But although the fatality numbers are still very, very high, over 700 people died in another 24-hour period in Italy, uh, it's horrific there. The infection rate, the day-to-day -day percentage of those newly infected is coming down. It's a pattern day by day that we're seeing. It's now into its third consecutive day. So people in Italy will be looking at that as possibly some light at the end of a very, very dark tunnel. And crucially, for the rest of us watching here in Europe and for the, in the United States, it might offer some kind of timeline as to when people might expect for the virus to be beaten there. So uh, a lot to hope for now in Italy going forward. The next few days and weeks are going to be crucial for Italy to see if it really has uh, beaten coronavirus. Yeah, Lizzie. people certainly watching and waiting. Thank you so much, James. Back here at home, there is no federal mandate, meaning, of course, that states across the country are handling this crisis in their own unique ways. Our reporters across the nation explain. In Whitworth in Los Angeles, and you're watching ABC News Live. Our cases of COVID-19 here in California are surging now to over 2,000. And we're just hearing sad news from officials that the death toll in L.A. County alone has reached 11. One of those deaths, though, was a person under the age of 18 years old. Now, this is happening as Mayor Eric Garcetti is taking unprecedented steps to keep people away from each other. While they're encouraging social, social distancing, they're also encouraging people to exercise so that means that our trails have been packed. Well, the mayor is saying no more. He wants all of L.A. County's trails to be closed, and so they're taking measures like this where they are putting caution tape up in front of the trailheads and the parking lots, and it says right here that this park is closed until further notice. They do not want people utilizing our trail systems here in L.A. County, and they're also starting to close the parking lots at our beaches as well. Hey there, I'm Alex Perez with ABC News in Chicago. So many people here, just like the rest of the country, still trying to adjust to what has become the new normal. The governor of Illinois has issued a shelter in place or stay at home order until at least April 7th. And so what that means is that a lot of streets are uh, deserted. You see a car or two drive by every now and then, and that's just about it. There really is no rush hour, which you would think would be a relief, but actually seems kind of eerie. I'm Steve Osinsami, um in Atlanta, suburban Atlanta, actually. Here, the governor and the mayor aren't on the same page. The governor has resisted pressure to shut down the state except for essential services. The mayor of Atlanta took matters into her, her own hands yesterday and essentially pretty much closed the city. I was just at the grocery store and I tried to get some pictures of it um, without violating their rules. Um, but one thing I do want to show you is something I saw that was outside the grocery store. It's sort of like a mini hazmat suit that um, the grocery store has put outside the doors. The store was actually also pretty busy, which sort of makes you wonder whether, you know, some of these um, 
precautions are really going to work. I'm Victor Okendo in Miami, one of the hardest hit cities in the state. Normally during the lunch hour, this area here in South Miami would be bustling. We'd see busy streets, the sidewalks would be packed, but right now all non-essential businesses are closed. Restaurants are open, but they can only do takeout. So far, Governor Ron DeSantis has not issued a statewide shutdown, saying he doesn't want to cause any unnecessary financial hardship, but he has ordered anyone coming into the state from New York, New Jersey, or Connecticut to self-isolate for 14 days. The mayor of the city of Miami, Francis Suarez, who did test positive for coronavirus and went into self-isolation, he has called for an emergency meeting to discuss a possible citywide shelter in place. For now, he he is urging residents to stay at home unless they absolutely have to leave. People here in Dallas have been told to stay in their homes and businesses forced to close as this virus continues to spread. Already more than 160 cases reported here in North Texas alone. And an official in Houston says hospitals there have seen an exponential increase in the number of patients being treated for COVID-19. But amidst the anxiety and worry, there is real hope here that better days are ahead. We certainly hope so, Marcus. Thank you all to all of the reporters for that. We now turn to a country offering signs of hope and a possible roadmap to combat the coronavirus, South Korea. This Asian nation of 50 million people reported its first COVID-19 case this very same day as the United States. Now it reports only 64 new cases in a day, down from thousands and a flattening of that infection curve that we hear so much about. Their success is so stark that President Trump, according to South Korean officials, asked their president for help with medical supplies. ABC's Juhee Cho has more from South Korea on how that nation's early and aggressive approach has so far made a significant difference. The United States now has over 50,000 cases of COVID-19, with over 600 deaths, a number that is expected to grow exponentially in the next couple of weeks. But across the world in South Korea, a country about 870 miles from what had been the epicenter of the outbreak, it's a different story. COVID-19 arriving in South Korea from China on the same day this took place. This evening, it's here in the U.S. Our Ian panel was in Daegu, South Korea, where the disease first spread on a massive scale among a religious sect. This hospital is now at the center of the outbreak in South Korea. There are more than 200 patients inside and all of them have COVID-19. But since then, the South Korean government has largely been able to grab the reins of the infection. Today, the country has over 9,000 cases of novel coronavirus, but only 76 new infections, a drastic contrast to the United States. And I can tell you that the infection rates uh, are roughly one in 1,000 in the New York City metropolitan area, where they are 0.2% per 1,000 or 0.1% per 1,000 in places like Washington State. South Korea is becoming the model for success, quickly expanding the scope and scale of massive testings in the past five weeks. So far, more than 340,000 people have tested there. Uh, so they made sure they had enough ventilators, they had enough uh, personal protective equipment, uh, made sure masks were being produced and mass produced. So all those things, that's the full set of epidemic strategies they implemented very quickly. From the first confirmed patient, the South Korean government sprung into action. The Korean FDA expediting the mass production of test kits, their military able to set up and organize testing facilities due to their mandatory military service. Army doctors were already on standby, trained to work during a crisis. The authorities vigorously tracked down on those infected and quarantined their contacts. The government here sends out national emergency alert messages throughout the day. And look how many I got in the past couple of days. It's basically information about who was tested positive in my neighborhood. It's highly controversial, but catches two birds with one stone, raises awareness and keep people away from contaminated areas. The striking difference in most Asian countries compared to the streets in the U.S. or Europe, everyone wears masks. Now, the government here allows you to buy two masks a week, depending on the last digit of your birth year. You go on an app and search for the nearest pharmacy that still would have stock. But the message here is very simple. If you don't have a mask in hand, just stay home. 
As testing surpassed thousands per day, medical teams created drive through centers, making the process four times faster from an hour to just 15 minutes. A week later, doctors further improved the process. A walk-through testing booth that again halved testing times. Testing times reduced to seven minutes. This booth keeps medical staff from any physical contact with a potential infector while taking samples. The governing bodies of the world are taking notice as they grapple with this new normal and try to find solutions that don't yet exist. So they look to a country caught in the storm that's making its way out of troubled waters. Juhi Cho, ABC News, Seoul, South Korea. Certainly some lessons that we could learn from right here are thanks to ABC's Juhi Cho. And when we return, a sign of the times, do-it-yourself masks. Why did this happen? I don't know. A virus out of control can't go anywhere. Stuck in my house, people need health care. We're shut down. Everything's closed. Don't touch your face or you might get exposed. Stay safe. Stay clean. Hammer time. This is Nick Savino with a creative PSA while isolating at home, of course, recreating MC Hammer's 1990 classic, you Can't Touch This. Using only household cleaning products. Check out that talent. And finally, tonight, healthcare providers are concerned that in this time of crisis, they are starting to run low on face masks and other medical supplies. So here's a glimpse at how people are stepping up and helping out amid the face mask shortage. Take a look at fashion designer Christian Siriano and his team. After hearing the plea for help from New York's governor for masks, Siriano jumped right into action. You can st you can see them all sewing. I think, do we have some video of them sewing? They're using some creative ways to social distance. I guess we don't have that video, but oh, there, there they are. Uh, but his hope is that his team is able to produce a few thousand masks each week, and he's not uh, the only fashion designer that's helping out. Check out Brianna Danielle. She's turning her living room into a mini sewing factory. Unfortunately, our country was not ready to handle a pandemic. We don't have enough medical supplies. It's simple as that. This is a crisis response. I have the talent of sewing, and this is what I can do right now. I can make masks. I can make medical supplies. And Whatever your talent, whatever your gift is, everybody can do something right now. Using our talents and putting them into action, Danielle just finished studying fashion in Italy and has written Estamos Listos, and we got this on her masks. 
And you don't have to be a fashion or designer to help out. Check out these volunteers at Providence St. Joseph Health. They've been churning out homemade equipment to fill the need for essential hospital supplies. The team has not only built surgical masks, they've also constructed face shields using approved materials that include marine grade vinyl, strips of foam, elastic bands, and double sided tape. Gotta love that double sided tape. It has multiple uses. And the popular retail chain Joanne Fabrics has crafted a way to help locals and frontline workers. The store is offering a do-it-yourself medical mask kit. The store even uploaded a step-by-step -step YouTube tutorial on how to make it. Customers can either use them or bring their newly constructed mask back into any Joanne Fabrics store to be donated to local hospitals and first responders. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. Take a look at pollution levels in China. There you see it, before the pandemic and now. Life will return to normal and so will pollution eventually. But tonight, this is something we are seeing as a silver lining and we will take it. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of our day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and have a good night.